Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Japan and we're going to return to a brewery that has now featured on the channel a good few times before. Now, I've had some really nice beers from these guys over the last little while. They are still a relatively new addition to the Japanese beer scene, but they've built up a very good reputation for themselves. And based on the beers that I've tried so far, that reputation is well justified. So if people were to ask me about these these guys I would say that they're best known for their different kinds of IPAs and the beer that we're going to have a look at today is one of their latest releases at the time of filming February 2024 and it is supposed to be very nice it is a style that we've had from them before and I was impressed with the last uh, one of these that I had from them so yeah needless to say I'm very curious to see what this one's going to have in store for us hopefully it's another good beer hopefully it makes for an interesting review and as always i hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well so yeah for this review then we're going to head a little bit north of me here in osaka up to tokyo the japanese capital and we're going to go to toshima to be specific and that means that we're going to have a look at yet another beer from the wonderful inkhorn brewing so this particular beer is called flycatcher it comes in at seven percent abv and this one is a West Coast IPA, and it's got quite a classic hop line up in this, so I'm looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, this is the second West Coast IPA I've had from these guys. The last one, which was the very first beer ever reviewed from them, was uh, was a really good West Coaster. I think that was uh, in collaboration with um, Izakaruya, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, very, very good beer, and I really enjoyed that. And the last beer that we did, from um, Inkhorn as well was a beautiful New England in collaboration with uh, with West Coast Brewing. So I think this is the first solo brewery beer review that I'm doing involving Inkhorn, which is kind of cool too. But yeah, I love my West Coast IPAs. I've been missing them over the last few years because of the haze craze, but they do seem to be making a little bit of a comeback, which I'm very happy about. So hopefully this one is as good as I know the IPAs from Inkhorn can be. Let's crack on and see what it's got in store for us. So, as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Inkhorn Brewing before, and we will no doubt add more to that list at some point in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support that you give is massively appreciated. And remember, you can go into the channel home page and search for beer using the geography tagging system so just go in there use the little search bar put in your hometown state county province whatever you like if i've reviewed beers from the area that you search for they will pop up failing that though you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries you'll find this one in the japanese playlist along with a number of other things that's being added to quite regularly at the moment as well and remember you can check out the playlist of beers from other countries as well. There's some really interesting things on the channel these days, so do make sure you check them out. You'll also find the link down there to Liquor Shop Asahiya, which is where this beer was bought. A lovely little liquor shop here, or alcohol beer shop, in uh, Taishibashi Amanchi in Osaka, run by Koji and his daughter Rika. Mainly Rika these days, because Koji's getting a bit older, but they've got a great selection of Japanese stuff, which they're always keeping up to date, and uh, they've got things from all over the world as well. So do make sure you check them out. Lovely people, and they supply most of the beer that I review for you here in Japan. But uh, yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you a wee bit about Inkhorn Brewing once again then. So, Inkhorn Brewing, as I've mentioned to you already, is based in Toshima in Tokyo and the main man behind this company is Shun Nakade, who is originally from Koto Ward in Tokyo and he runs the company with his wife Amy Holdsworth, who's originally from Connecticut in New England in the American Northeast. So apparently Shun's parents were very into kind of fine food and drink and this really rubbed off on him somewhat. But he attended high school in Oregon in the Pacific uh, Northwest of the US and then he moved to Seattle to study music theory and psychology. And it was during this time that he discovered craft beer, although he didn't recognize it as being such a specialized and unique thing at the time. It was when he returned to Japan and wondered why he couldn't find it, the types of beers that he'd been drinking in America that things really started to come into place for him. So after this he started frequenting bars that were selling German and Belgian beers and uh, he just kind of took it from there. But during the 2010s he was working in administration and also as a translator and interpreter and he also started to try his hand at home brewing as well. But later on in 2018 
He became involved in the launch of a brew pub called Pittman's in Koto Ward and it was here that he had the first opportunity to brew commercially and after a while he was left to his own devices and he also helped brew for a little while at Choshi Beer and at Tsukuba Brewery as well. But by 2020 he had decided that he wanted to open his own project and he started travelling around and collaborating with other breweries until he opened his own space in 2021. The name Inkhorn was chosen as a reference to the animal ink wells that were animal horn ink wells that were used popularly by uh, scholars in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. And Shun says that uh, he felt these were a great source of inspiration because the ink was transformed into words, and at the time scholars were kind of debating. Uh, using foreign words to describe things and introducing that into the English language. And he kind of feels that he's bringing American beer, brewing culture and other brewing culture into Japan. So it kind of just fits as a metaphor, if you like. But um, this is one of the, I think that's quite a nice idea, actually, but a very, very unusual name. Um, but the tap room has been designed by Amy, and she's got a passion for birds and avian conservation. And this is also the inspiration behind much of the Inkhorn artwork that you'll find and uh, the names of the beers as well. So um, yeah, this one obviously flycatcher, beautiful little bird, I have to say. Um, so yeah, I do really like that about uh, the Inkhorn beer. It's very unique in that sense. But when they started up the brewery, the the brew room was equipped with two five liter, uh, two sorry, two five barrel, approximately six hundred liter, and two ten barrel, approximately twelve hundred liter tanks. And the brewing has just been gradually scaled up over the years. But at the time of filming, February 2024, these guys have produced 110 different kinds of beer according to Untapped, and that number will no doubt continue to increase as time goes on. But uh, yeah, that is everything I can really tell you about Inkhorn Brewing for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Reap Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all of the different beers that these guys have done. So yeah, let's go on and have a little look at the beer itself. So I'll just let you have a wee look at the artwork on this one before we open up there. You can see the artwork once again is absolutely lovely with this plain silver top on the can. This is a 355 milliliter can, which is a standard measurement here in Japan. I think that's based on one of the American ones, if I remember correctly, so many fluid ounces. But it says on the back here, Flycatcher West Coast IPA. Flycatcher features the aromatic trium, uh, trium, triumvirate. I've never heard that word. Trium, triumvirate of uh, of mosaic, simcoe, and citra, lending tropical overtones with a hint of traditional pine. Refreshing, light bodied, and easy to drink. Inkhorn Brewing. So um, yeah, I'm just a bit perplexed by that. Uh, uh, trium, triumvirat. Um, is that how you would pronounce it? I know it means it basically means like a cadre of three or something like this, but still, not a word that I've seen used in a a very long time. Well, or ever, probably not ever. Okay, uh, but yeah, my brain's a bit messed up with Swedish, German, and Japanese and Chinese these days. So yeah. Makes sense. But yeah, some very nice hops in this one. All American. A mosaic, 14% alpha acid. It's going to give you that lovely big kind of tangerine note. Simcoe, 12% alpha acid. It's going to give you a nice oily passion fruit in a West Coast IPA. And then Citra, of course, is one of your classic hops. 14% alpha acid. Lots of mango, a little bit of kind of grapefruit and things like that. And it can give you a wee bit of a lemon lime and sort of lychee, gooseberry character in a West Coast IPA as well. So yeah, um, a 7% of this one. I'll just let you have a wee look there because there you can see the Inkhorn, one of the Inkhorn brewing symbols. They use a few different ones actually. But yeah, let's get this guy out into the glass and see what it's all about. I'm curious about this. I'm also quite curious as to whether this beer has been released before and this is simply a new batch. I might have told you lies at the start of the video saying that this was a fairly recent release. It might just be a kind of rebrew if you like. But yeah, it was one of the recent releases from Koji uh, at liquor shop Asahiya, so that's why I say that. So yeah, do take it when I say it's a new release, you should always maybe take that with a pinch of salt when it comes to beers from Japan, because yeah, it's things that, you, the distribution thing in Japan is very, very strange actually. But uh, yeah, some beers just don't make it outside of their own prefecture and things, but things are getting better. Beers are moving around the country a little bit more, which is great to see. But uh, anyway, 
7% West Coast IPA, this one, as uh, we mentioned earlier. You can see that it's poured pretty much as you would expect from the style as well. So before the head disappears, we can see that it's poured with about a half finger of a frothy, I would say, perfect white head. That's just fade, fading away to be a very thin foamy layer, but you've got that nice ring around the, uh, the edge of the glass there. Color-wise, if we shine the light through this, it's a very nice kind of pale... I wouldn't, don't know if I'd go quite as far as saying pale golden straw, but quite a rich golden yellow colour. So um, you can see crystal clear as well. But remember, the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any barrel aging that you do or adjuncts you put into the beer will affect its colour too. But you don't have to care about that when it comes to uh, to West Coast IPAs, uh, or any IPA for the for that matter. It's only really fruit IPAs, I think, where you might have to care about that a wee bit. But um, yeah, for me, um, the West Coast IPAs can lean two ways. They can be a little bit more kind of biscuity. Uh, yeah, they can be a little bit more kind of biscuity and sweet, or they can be a little bit more kind of, uh, they can be a bit more biscuity and bready, I would say, or they can be a bit more kind of oily and caramelly. Those are the two ends of the spectrum, you know. Um, at one end, you've got the, uh, you know, the Sierra Nevada Torpedo is probably quite a big oily one for me. Um, and I would say at the other end, you've got the uh, Russian River Plain of the Elder, where that's a more kind of biscuity, um, kind of a biscuity, bready type uh, West Coast IPA. So yeah, for me, those are two of the benchmarks of this particular style. So I'm quite curious to see where this one is going to lean, but I'm guessing from the colour, it will be a bit more of a bready and biscuity one rather than being oily and caramelly, because yeah, well, you've got a lot of caramel in there you would expect more of a kind of blood orangey amber colour. But um, yeah, this one certainly does look very, very nice. So let's have a wee look at the uh, aroma of this one and see how we get on. I'm really curious about this. Ooh, that smells good. Yeah, um, pretty much it's given you everything you would expect of the style. And it does come across as being quite old school and that's probably due to the hop built that's involved here, you know, Mosaic, Citra and Simcoe, um, hops that have been around for a good while and they're still very prominent because of just how, you know, how much everybody loves them. Um, but yeah, this is very, very nice. So it gives you everything you'd expect from the style. You've got that little bit of malty sweetness in there. You've got a nice kind of big green component. Um, you've got a nice big green component and you've got that kind of oily, fruity um, sort of thing coming out of it as well. And it's quite nicely balanced actually. But let's just break this aroma down for you and describe it a wee more in depth as we often do. So, um, for me, the backbone of the beer, you've got a lovely bit of kind of fresh white bready bread crust in there. There's a wee teeny bit of like, you do get a little bit of that woody crackery sort of thing that you often get from both New England and West Coast IPAs. Um, so yeah, woody crackery note, brown bread, um, on top of that, you do get a nice bit of a kind of sweet brown bready character coming out of this one, um, it smells like it's European malt that's in this. Because um, you just get a little bit more of that crisp breadiness rather than the kind of sweeter, oily breadiness and caramelly notes that you would expect of the uh, the American two rows or something like this. So yeah, that's quite interesting. But for me, as I say, the yeah, the the malty side of things is really nice. Um, you on top you've got you've got the brown bread, the white bread, you've got a little bit of kind of sweet McVitie's digestive biscuit, and the wee touch of caramel as well. So yeah, straight up kind of sweet caramel, McVitie's digestive biscuit too, and then you've also got um, just a little bit. You got the sweet oily caramel, McVitie's digestive biscuit, and then you've got the um, yeah, you've just got a little bit of a. I get a wee tiny bit of like there's just something in there that's almost a little very slight a little touch fudgy which i wasn't expecting so yeah that's really interesting this one but yeah oily caramel a little bit of booziness as well 
a wee teeny bit of fudge for some reason. And then yeah, McVitie's digestive biscuit. I think that covers everything we need to say about the, the malty side of the beer, to be honest with you. Let's focus on the hoppy side of things. So as I've mentioned to you on the channel many times before, when it comes to making IPAs, you have three types of hoppings you can do. Early edition hopping, which takes place within the first hour of the wort boil, that gives you mainly bitterness in your flavor, then a deeper, danker aroma. You've got late edition hopping, which takes place within your last half hour of the wort boil, that gives you mainly flavor and aroma, but it also gives you, uh, it also gives you a little bit of um, kind of bitterness as well, but not too much. And it will give you quite a bright green component in terms of flavor and aroma. Then dry hopping, which takes place after the wort boil is complete. That's all flavor and aroma. And it's going to, you know, that's all flavor and aroma. And it's going to give you, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's going to give you um, a very bright green component as well. So West Coast IPAs tend to use all three types of hoppings, which is why they have a deeper, danker aroma. New England IPAs tend to rely on late addition and dry hop. And the other two, uh, the other variances between this style is that a West Coast IPA tends to use mostly barley malt, pretty much a um, little bit of wheat sometimes, and I have seen a little bit of oat in these, but it's yeah, mostly barley malt, whereas New England IPAs almost always use barley malt and wheat and wheat and or uh, oats and sometimes a bit of rye as well. I've seen that too. So um, yeah, things to think about with these styles. But what you can smell with this green component here is that I think there is a little bit of early edition hopping going on, but not overly much. This might be one of the more kind of modern takes on the West Coast IPA. More modern versions of this particular beer style are less bitter. They're not the 80, 90 IBU beasts that you used to get back in the day, although I have seen that the bitterness of these is creeping back up uh, as of recently. But for me, the aroma of this beer, um, you've got a little bit of earthiness on the green component, which will be from the mosaic. You've got a, you don't get so much in the way of piney resin, but you've got a nice big floral aromaticity. You've also got some nice uh, grassiness in there, which I do enjoy as well. So yeah, lovely big kind of grassy character coming out of this one. And uh, yeah, you've also got that, um, yeah, you can get, you just start to get all the fruits behind that as well. So the green component on this one is quite nice. It's quite an oily green component actually. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. So on the, um, yeah, on the, the fruity side of things then for me I'd say it's quite interesting I get quite I do get quite a lot of like passion fruit and mango and that's going to obviously be uh, the Simcoe giving you the passion fruit and the mango coming from the the citra but I do actually get quite a little bit of a kind of gooseberry type thing in there and that's going to be citra that gives you that but there's a lot of orange a nice kind of bright tangerine orangey note from the mosaic which isn't surprising because I know all three of these hops pretty damn well but there's just something that's kind of a bit nostalgic and a bit um, familiar about the, the sort of vibe that this beer gives off. And that makes me quite excited to uh, to try this one. But as I always say, take a wee bit of time just to enjoy that aroma before you get stuck in. Because uh, this is, you know, it's always half the experience when it comes to craft beer. But let's have a little taste of this then and see what it's all about. Uh, this one is the Flycatcher 7% West Coast IPA from Inkhorn Brewing in Toshima, in Tokyo, in Japan. Citra, Mosaic, and Simcoe. Slanja, Skoll, Cheers, Kampai. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, I'm just waiting to see with it whether the bitterness kind of builds up a bit more you do get a bit more sweetness out of it and you do get a wee bit more bitterness uh, the further into the aftertaste you go. But it's not overly, um, you know, it's not overly reliant on either side of things. I think it's just really nicely balanced, this one. So it gets a big thumbs up from me. Yeah. Certainly can't complain about that. It's definitely a more kind of biscuity, bready leaning West Coast IPA as well, as I suspected it would be from the colour. So yeah, that's not really a surprise to be honest with you. 
Um, but yeah, good stuff. Really nice stuff, actually. So let's just break this one down then and describe it for you a wee bit more in depth. We'll start on the middle third of the palette, as we always do. So at the backbone of the beer, you've got that lovely kind of fresh brown bready uh, character just pushing its way out of this beer. Um, so for me, the... The bread, the, the that fresh kind of brown bready bread crust that's in there lingers into the aftertaste and just gives you that wee bit of kind of graininess. But as you move further forward in that middle uh, third of your palate, you can feel the little bit of woodiness in there. Yeah, there's a little bit of woodiness in there. Um, and there's a little touch of like crackery note as well. But then above all of that, you've got the brown bready notes. Yeah, so you've got the kind of brown bready notes in there. Um, yeah, so a layer of brown bread, then a layer of white bread. And above that, you have... Yeah, above that, you've got some... Um, <clears throat> you've got some really nice um, kind of sweeter components to the beer. So you've got the bread crust, the brown bread... The white bread and I would say that those bready layers are actually quite crisp they're not too oily or sweet or anything like that they're actually quite crisp bready layers but then you start to get the more kind of sweet layers out of this West Coast IP as well so you've got a kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity layer um, so yeah McVitie's digestive biscuity kind of layer coming out of this one that's the base of that kind of uh, brown sugary note and you can just feel that it gets a little bit more grainy as you go out toward the extremities of that middle third of your palate. And then in the dead centre of your tongue, you can feel that little oily circle there which has got the really kind of sweet, you've got that really kind of sweet caramelly character in there but you've also got the kind of booziness as well, which is nice. So yeah, I do like how that, I really do like how that pieces together. Um, on the, yeah, on the, the sweeter side of things with this beer then, you have, uh, you can feel it gets sweeter and sweeter into the after, the further into the aftertaste that you go, but you do get that lingering little bitterness there. And at 7% ABV, you know, it's not the, you know, 7% um, seems to be a fairly common thing for West Coast IPAs in Japan, come to think of it. Because we had the Isakaruya one the other day that was the same ABV. So they like 7% over here for this. But I've noticed in Europe, uh, they tend to go for like 6 or so, which is quite interesting. And I'm finding, yeah, these 7% ones, to me, they come across as a little boozy. But I'm just wondering if that's a... A sort of point of reference thing because I think seven percent is fairly common for um, for these West Coast IPAs over in the West Coast of the US. So yeah, we bit of an interesting thought there. But yeah, you get a bit more biscuity sweetness and a bit more boozy sweetness out of this one the further into the uh, the aftertaste that you go as well. So um, yeah, I like this. But I think that's everything we need to say about the middle third of the palate with this beer. Let's go to the back third of the palate then. So the border region between um, middle and back third of your palate, you get that nice little bit of um, brown bready character on the base and the white bread on top. Um, I, yeah, I really do like how that piece is here. So the brown bread on the base, the white bread on the top, and then the backbone of the... Um, <clears throat> the backbone of that back third of your palate, you can feel the bread crusty character is just a little bit drier. As I've often said, the back third of your palate is going to give you similar flavours to the middle third of your palate, just usually a little bit drier and a bit lighter at certain points. So you've got that brown bready layer, which feels a little bit lighter and more eerie. Then you've got uh, the white bready character that sits above that, which is also a bit lighter and more eerie. And then, yeah, 
you have the um yeah you've got a good little bit of kind of grainy character that sits above that too which i do like so yeah it's interesting um yeah so yeah, you can feel a wee bit that that bready layer on the back is definitely yeah definitely taller and lighter and more airy but then above all of that you get a wee bit of a yeasty note out of this one so you can feel there's a dense sweet um brown bready character sitting in the middle of the yeasty notes there then you can feel there's a bit of a lighter more airy brown bready character sitting around that too and then you've also got that little bit of um yeah you have that little bit of how would you say just a bit more of a kind of grainy bready character uh going around the side you know just going around the edge of that too which i think is very nice so yeah the way that everything pieces together in this beer i think is really interesting so yeah i really do like i do like how that uh, pieces together in this one it's really interesting um but definitely yeah the yeasty character in this beer is just sweet bread bit of a kind of farmhouse of bread around it and a wee bit more green on the outside and definitely on the back third of your palate you can feel the flavor it is taller then as you move further forward into the middle third of your tongue it just kind of compresses down and squashes together that little bit more so yeah the way that that goes together is uh, is really quite nice on the uh, hoppy side of things, and let's focus on that. I would say that the bitterness in this beer has been building up a wee bit the more that I've drank of it. Um, but it certainly is. It, I would still stick with what I said before, that it's a more modern take on the West Coast IP. It's not going to blow the head off you in terms of bitterness. So in the back corners of the palate, you do get a nice little bit of earthiness in there. As you move further forward, there's a wee touch of uh, herbal character too. But as you push further forward... Um, as you push further forward toward the kind of front corners of the palate, you get a little bit more floral aromaticity, and it's a wee touch spicy as well, which I do quite enjoy. Um, so yeah, I like that about this one. Yeah, the way that this goes together, I think, is uh, is really nice. Um. You do get that little bit of zesty grassiness around the front curve of the tongue too, but yeah, a wee bit more spicy and floral on the front corners of your palate. But And there's a wee tiny hint of that kind of piney resin as well. Um, and that will be from the early edition hopping rather than anything else. But the green component in this one is pretty nice actually, and that gets a thumbs up from me. Um, <clears throat> on the... I'm just trying to think on the uh, on the green component i don't think we need to say much more so let's focus on the front third of your palate and the fruity side of things so the border region between front third and middle third of your palate you get a nice little bit of a kind of bready build up in there um there's a bit of brown bread in the base and white bread on top um so yeah brown bread in the base white bread on top then you've got that um you've got that um Front on the front third of your palate, you can feel there's that wee bit of bread crust in there, the brown bread, the white bread, and then you've got that nice oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters just kind of roll their way out of the beer, and that's quite nice. So yeah, the the oily, uh, the fruity side of this beer is kind of what you'd expect if you know these hops at the back of that front there you pout you get a little bit of grapefruit which is the citra as you move further forward you get a wee bit you start to get more of the passion fruit which is quite oily and that's yeah that's the simcoe that's giving you that then as you reach the middle of the front third of your palate that's the yeah that's the juice the kind of oil, the more I always thought, you know, for me, New England IPs are juicy. Um, the fruity character in West Coast IPs is more oily. So, yeah, it's a more oily mango that you're getting out of this. Then as you move into the front half of the front third of your palate, you can feel there's that little gooseberry lychee sort of thing, maybe a little touch of lime as well from the citra. But then, yeah, it's all about that kind of 
uh, the kind of oily orange mosaic-y type qualities coming out of the beer too. So the way that that all goes together I think is really nice. And as I said earlier, it feels very familiar. So um, yeah, I like that with this one. It's a thumbs up from me. Um, on the... <clears throat> Yeah, on the, the flavour side of things, I think we said everything we need to. Um, this is a really nice West Coast IPA. It is definitely more along the the kind of bready and biscuity uh, end of the spectrum, but it works, and I think it's another very solid IPA from Mint Corn Brewing as well. Let's just round off this review with a wee quick look at the mouthfeel. For me, this beer is kind of right in the middle of the spectrum. It's mid-bodied. The carbonation does have a little bit of crispness to it. Very clean, actually. This one comes across as being very, very clean. And it has that, you know, Japanese drinkability that I often talk about in these videos. So yeah, nice kind of clean uh, drinkability. In terms of the IBU count, I think this is maybe about 50-ish. I think it's, yeah, about 50 IBUs, this one. Um, 60 is possible as well, but yeah, about 50 would be would be my guess for this beer. Then you also have, um, in the malt base, you've got a little bit of graininess. In the base, you've got smoothness in the middle, then a bit of oily sweetness on top. Then, yeah, you get that nice big oily uh, fruity character coming out of this one as well. You've got a little bit of tropical fruit in there, but quite a little bit of citrusy character too, both from the grapefruit from the, the citra and the, the tangerine oranges from the uh, mosaic as well. But overall, I think it's uh, it's really quite nice. So yeah, um, the way that all that pieces together, I think, is makes for a very nice West Coast IP. And I certainly wouldn't hesitate to drink this again. I have a feeling this might not be a, a, a one-off brew. I've got a feeling that I might have seen this one somewhere before. This could be one of their kind of more regular uh, beers, but I like it, and that's the main thing. So, yeah, let's leave it at that for this one. This was the Flycatcher, a 7% West Coast IPA from Inkhorn Brewing in Toshima in Tokyo here in Japan. Another very good beer from these guys. I'll need to see about trying something a bit darker from them next time, I think. A stout or... Uh, or maybe even one of the laggers or something like that. We'll try a few things away from the IPA part of the, the beer world, if you like. But yeah, awesome beer, this one. Check out this beer if you get the chance. Thank you again for watching my videos. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Inkhorn down uh, in the comment section as well. And I will see you guys in the next review very shortly. Slanja, Skull, cheers and kampai.